NTI Tihan is the Philippines' biggest annual celebration. It occurs every January in the town of Calibo, located on an island south of Manila in the Philippines. People all over the Philippines and the world travel to be a part of this annual event. Welcome to Summer Bakes the Roll. This channel bakes traditional dishes from all over the world, providing some history and tips. Today is all about the Philippines. The Antia Tihan Festival was originally a pagan celebration rooted in animism, later influenced by Christianity from the Spanish. The festival begins in the streets with rhythmic drum beats, tribal and snake dancing, urf, indigenous costumes and weapons, along with a rosary procession, and ending with a community mass with displayed images of Santo Nino, the Holy Child, referring to baby Jesus. It is said these celebrations are in honor of Santo Nino and have been in existence for more than 800 years. So, with all the parades, costumes, dancing, and competitions, hmm, can we say the Filipino version of Madika or Carnival? Regardless, it is Filipino culture in its entirety, only reminiscent of other cultures. So, in honor of this country's biggest festival, I thought we could make their traditional bread roll. With influence from many countries, you can find everything from Latin American empanadas to Chinese dumplings, seafood, chicken, pork, duck, coconut, vegetables, noodles, along with flavors from adobo, soy sauce, garlic, butter, and chili. This all makes up the Filipino cuisine. Talk about worldly. Unlike many Asian dishes though, you will find cheese, cheese, and more cheese in Filipino cuisine. That's where this country differs from its neighbors and where the Western influence is evident. Thus, I think you'll find that this bread is familiar yet unique. Filipino cuisine is definitely a fusion of East meets West. The ensaymada bread we are making today can be described as buttery, lightly sweetened, pillowy roll topped with butter, sugar, and cheese. Whew, heavenly. Often served as a dessert or snack. In fact, it isn't uncommon to find it topped with frosting and cheese. What? Well, it is one of the oldest Filipino breads and known to be a variation of Spanish culture. I absolutely love this bread. And while I can no longer eat it, tear, I can't wait to make it. It's such a fun, versatile roll that can take on almost any and all flavor combinations within the swirls like a cinnamon roll. So let's look at the ingredients. Oh, I'm so excited about this bread. Yeast, water, all purpose flour, salt, sugar, eggs, evaporated milk, butter, cheese, the tradition in Philippines is Edom cheese, which is the same as Gouda. We're using Gouda today, but I have made this with a cheddar, a white cheddar, and it is just as good. Sugar, eggs, milk, butter. Oh my. Trust me though, these insane mata rolls are very tasty and indulgent. You really should give these a try. It is one of the most versatile and beautiful breads I've ever made and most definitely one of my favorites. It can be made as a savory or sweet bread. I'll explain that a little later. Let's get this bake going. So we first need to bloom our yeast. So in a small bowl, I'm going to place two teaspoons of yeast. Now, a package that you buy from the grocery store is gonna be two and a quarter teaspoons. I've never tried a two and a quarter teaspoons, so I, you know, you could try it. It probably will be fine. That extra quarter may not matter much, but I'm doing two teaspoons. At a third of a cup of warm water, we want it warm enough so that it blooms the yeast, but not too hot, so we want it between that 100 and 110 degree mark. So we're going to set our yeast aside for about 10 minutes. That will give it enough time to become frothy and a little bubbly, and that tells us that it will have bloomed and it's alive and working well. So in the meantime, let's sift our flour. We're gonna need three and three quarters of a cup of flour. Putting in my last quarter cup here, remember to fluff your flour in the container before you spoon it into your measuring cup so that you don't add too much flour than what you need. And most of the time, I don't sift my flour. Not all recipes call for it, but like with my grandma's roll, sifted flour allows for a lighter, easier to rise bread dough 
which is particularly important when you're dealing with rolls because rolls are meant to be light and fluffy. So like with my grandma's rolls, I sift my flour and these rolls, I'm gonna sift the flour. And that's it. Once you sift it, it's loose, it's light, it won't be dense, and you should have a nice fluffy roll. Okay, our three and three quarters of a cup flour, sifted, ready to go, waiting to be added to the rest of the dry ingredients. I'm making these rolls in my stand mixer. So you could probably do this by hand. I've never done it by hand, but hey, it's bread. You can always knead by hand. There's never a reason why you can't. So, but I'm using my mixer today. So in my mixer, we're going to place the three and three quarters of a cup of flour that we sifted. Remember, this is all purpose flour. Okay, and into that, we're gonna add a third of a cup of granulated sugar and I'm using cane sugar, that's always my preference when it comes to sugar. And then a half of a teaspoon of salt. Let's just whisk this all together before we put it on our stand mixer. We just have the dry ingredients in here, so I'm just gonna add it to my stand here. Now our dry ingredients are ready for the wet ingredients. So we're gonna add our frothy little mixture here of yeast and water. To that we're gonna add a third of a cup of warm water. This is that 100 to 110 degrees of warm water. We're gonna add three eggs. So I have two that are cracked. I'm gonna crack my third one here. It's always good to crack your eggs in a separate bowl so that you eliminate getting any shells in your dish as well as getting a bad egg. So those three eggs are really good. So. I can now put them in my mixture. They don't need to be beaten. You can just put them all in. So we have a dough hook or our hands or a spoon. The last thing we need is a fourth of a cup of evaporated milk. Now, here's a trick for something you should do when you are measuring liquids, is you always want your container on a flat surface when you pour in your liquids to ensure that you get the exact amount. So I do have exactly a quarter of a cup here. If I were to hold this up and pour, your hand may not be even enough parallel to the ground. And so therefore you might have more or less than what you need. So always place your container on a flat surface for all your liquids. And if you can't do that, pour your liquids in, sit it down, look at it, add more or pour out less. That's our liquid. So we're gonna add our dough hook. Okay, we've got the dough hook in, I think. And we're gonna turn it on low for two minutes. Our mixer has been going for at least two minutes. Let's take a look. I've done nothing to it but let it go. And it looks like a nice sticky dough. I want you to be able to see what's on the inside there. Next step is that we're gonna let it run another four minutes, but we're gonna crank up another one or two. So be low. We're gonna go with that for medium. So four minutes at this level. It's been four minutes. Let me take it down. I haven't touched the dough. I've just let it go for four minutes. And I want you to take a look at what it looks like now. So it's definitely smoothed out a little more than it was before. And notice the dough is just falling off of the dough hook. The last thing we need to add is butter. So you wanna melt a third of a cup of butter in the microwave, make sure it's not too warm. In fact, I know when mine's not too warm, I'll put it in for about 10, 15 seconds, stir it up, where it's gonna be really soft at that point, and then put it in for another five or 10, where you still have a couple of little chunks in there, and then you stir it until those chunks melt. That's how you know it's not too warm to add to a yeasted bread. I'm just gonna pour that into my dough. So take a look, it's been poured in. So it's just sitting there at the moment. That's all we have to add to the dough. So now we're gonna to continue to knead on low because we have liquid in there. We wanna make sure that that gluten doesn't develop too fast. Let's just knead it on low for another eight minutes. The dough will be sticky when it's ready. You can hear the flap of the dough against the pan here. The dough will be sticky, but just let it knead for the eight minutes in your mixer. If you're using it by hand, you might have to add some flour, but you don't need to add a lot of flour to it. So try to put as minimal flour as you can in it. Otherwise, just let the mixer do it and don't add any flour. It's been eight minutes. So let's look and see where we are now. Pretty smooth dough. Let's look at the inside of the bowl. Pretty smooth, huh? We're gonna let this rest now. So I'm gonna remove my dough hook. We're gonna allow for 15 minutes for this dough just to sit in the bowl. And I'm not even gonna remove it from the base here, but I will scrape it all down. So at least looks like a nice little neat mass. This is what it looks like. All right, so just put some plastic over the top just to keep the drafts out. This isn't necessarily rising time, this is just resting time. Making sure the gluten has time to just kind of do its thing. It doesn't need a ton of work here at this point. 15 minutes at room temperature, we're just gonna let this sit. All right, I let mine go for more than 15 minutes, but it's fine because we're not expecting a big rise. We just wanted simply for it to rest. Take a look, it has definitely risen a little bit, but you would expect that. Let's just deflate it. It's a nice, pretty sticky dough. 
This definitely looks like and feels like a thick enriched dough. And enriched dough just means it has butter and milk and eggs. We're done with the kneading. We're done with the resting for now. We need to divide it. So we're gonna divide this dough into 15 equal pieces. I'm using my scale to weigh out my dough because it should be 60 grams. But if you don't have a scale, don't fret because 60 grams is comparable to a quarter of a cup of dough. Here's what I found is the easiest way to do it. Once you get your dough in the cup, when you take it out, that's the size that it's gonna be, right? You wanna put it on a floured surface because you're gonna to have to make 15 of these and these need to sit somewhere where they're probably going to rise a little bit and we don't want them to stick to the surface. So just on your surface, I've got my favorite kneading board here. I'm just gonna put flour on it and you're just gonna sit it down so that it doesn't stick to the surface. And we're gonna do this for the other 14. Here's the trick for doing this. If you don't weigh them, take your quarter cup measuring cup. This dough is very, very sticky. Spray it with a little bit of cooking spray and then with a spoon, then just pack it, put your dough in there till it comes to the top and there you go. Do this 13 other times. And then it should come out fairly easy. So you notice that, not a lot of dough left and we're ready for the next. So do this for all 15. In the past when I've made these, I've measured them out so that they were all very close to 60 grams each. But since I've told you do the measuring cup, I'm gonna do that with all of mine this time. But for fun, what is a quarter of a cup really after I've done a few, are they all 60 grams or am I off a little bit? Let's try it. I've got my scale teared at zero with this little quarter of a cup on it. This was the first one that we actually measured, so I know it's 60. The rest of these, we did by quarter cup. That one is 61. The next one is 60. And then we have 61. And then the last one that I've done with quarter of a cup is 59. So we're right, 59 to 61, that's perfect. So the point of telling you this is you can trust your quarter of cup measuring cup. But make sure you get it in there and then touch the top to make sure it's flush with the edge of your cup. And that should be as close to 60 grams as you're gonna get. And it's a lot easier than to measuring it because you're gonna be pulling dough out, putting dough in. It's just a little easier. But I actually ended up with 16. So 15 or 16, either one will be fine. We're gonna cover these up with plastic wrap and let them sit for 15 minutes just so they get used to their new individual shapes. All right, our dough is pretty much done resting, but I wanted to show you real quick to go ahead and prepare your muffin pan. So I just put regular, these are large liners. I have 12 here. And then these rolls are pretty hardy and can hold themselves. So I just put four more liners on just another oven proof pan. We're gonna treat these like individual cinnamon rolls. So we're gonna move all but one out of the way. All right, let's flour our surface. We're gonna take, ooh, they're so nice and soft. We're gonna take one round here and we're gonna roll it out into a rectangle like you would a cinnamon roll. This rectangle should be about an eight by five. They're gonna be really thin. Now I have the best awesome idea for this activity with kids, with adults, and that is to make a roll bar. Yes, like a taco bar or a potato bar or a pizza bar. So what you would do is invite your friends over Give them little stations in your kitchen, either at the table or whatever. Give them each one or two rolls, depending on how many people you have. Have them flatten out the dough. And then give them a cream base. You need some softened butter. So what I did was I put my butter in the microwave for a few seconds, because I want it just a tad bit softer than room temperature. And the basic one that we're using is going to be just butter. We're just gonna brush the butter on our little rectangle here. The savory would be like a cream cheese or butter. You can even do something like a taco sauce, just something that would easily brush on but maybe not be too thin. If you want to do a sweet one, you could do like a nut butter or like a Nutella cream cheese that's sweetened. So have everyone put a cream layer down. Then you would have them do a topping, whatever they want. If it's a savory roll, have them do pepperoni and mozzarella and just sprinkle a little bit on top like you would in a cinnamon roll. Cinnamon and sugar would be fine. Um, you could do chocolate and coconut. It's endless. But there's a link in the description of this video with many, many, many savory and sweet variations of this roll. I've even described for you how to make a roll bar. But this is the kind of the visual of what that would look like. Then once people put their toppings on, then they'd start at one long end and then just roll up with the toppings, just keeping the toppings in, just like you would if you were making cinnamon rolls. Okay, notice how easy it just rolls up. And then I like to just mine, make mine just a little bit thinner and roll it out a little bit, but you don't have to do this. Directions don't say to do this. And then all you do is you coil it up like a snail, which actually in Filipino culture, this would be probably be more like a turban, and I'll explain that to you a little later. But then you seal that end underneath and there you are. 
So then with your friends, you'd give them each, you know, a roll like this, and then give them each uh, paper. And so then when they're finished making their first roll, if they're doing more than one, have them put it in the paper and it's ready to go. Okay, so that would be one. And if you have a small gathering, you can give everybody two. Have them do a sweet and a savory one so they have their dessert bread and they have their savory bread. And they could put, again, whatever toppings you give them to put on it, letting them choose what they want to do. And so then, because it takes an hour for these to rise, you go play a game with your friends. Now that's spending some quality of time with friends. You're making something productive. You're laughing and having a great time, making some fun creations. And then you get to play games and enjoy. You could do a book club during that time, that hour that you have to kill while the dough is rising. There's so many things that you could do and enjoy baking and cooking with your friends and to give them something to do when they come hang out with you. Great with kids too. All right, so quickly just roll them up. We have friends doing two. They can have their savory and their sweet one and then everyone puts them in a muffin tin and then let them rise and bake. All right, check out our beautiful ensamada rolls. Aren't they gorgeous? Those nice beautiful coils in the muffin tins. They each have their own space. And then of course I ran out of muffin tin room so I just put mine in muffin liners and on a muffin proof pan and they will still rise and be wonderful. I've done this before this way and it worked fine. So we're gonna sit them aside in a nice warm place. We're going to cover them back up like so and then just sit them over an oven that I have warmed at 200 degrees just to create that nice cozy warm space. These should rise quite a bit and almost double in size. So we'll go for an hour and see what they look like. So now let's let them rise. We are at the 45 minute mark. The Instamata rolls are rising beautifully. So it's time to preheat the oven to 325 degrees. An hour has passed and the rolls are ready for baking. Just take a quick look at how much they've risen. They've risen quite a bit, particularly the ones that have had that little free form to rise. They've done a really good job there. The ones in the muffin tin are above the muffin tin now, which they weren't when we put them in, but they are just gorgeous. We're gonna put them in the oven for 17 minutes or until golden brown, and then we'll break into them and give them a try. So our Filipino ensamada rolls are done. Take a look. I left mine in there for a total of 20 minutes, so three minutes longer than the recommended 17. You can see the swirls, the, the snails, or the turbans, if you will. And then notice the ones that are in the freeform pan where they didn't have the muffin to contain them. They still rose really well and they more expanded out on the, on the sides. Both are gonna make a beautiful roll to eat. So you could stop right here, get some butter like you would a normal yeast roll, rub it on top of the rolls and then eat them while they're hot. However, since we are following the traditional method, we're going to leave the ensamada rolls in their pans let them cool, then we'll come back and add the special toppings that make them uniquely Filipino. The ensamada rolls are cooled enough now. Take a quick look, you can see uh, the one that was not in the muffin tin versus the one that was in the muffin tin, but they're both pretty, they've risen, and they just look beautiful. So how you would prepare these in the Philippines, you would brush some butter on top, so this is softened butter, this is not melted butter. The butter needs to be able to hold on, it needs to be the glue that holds on the other stuff we're going to put on it, okay? So one step would be put butter on them, and then we're going to sprinkle with a little bit of cheese, and this is our Gouda cheese. So the butter again is gonna hold it on. Now, when I've made these before, I did the next step, but Scott and I both prefer to not have the sugar on them because we just like to eat them as a side item with dinner. But the next step would be to put on some sugar and it just adds a little bit of sweetness. So I did one of each and we'll let Scott try them and see if he has a preference, although I'm pretty sure I know what his answer is gonna be. Let's take a look at the inside of one of these rolls. We're gonna leave these decorated. I'm not gonna cut into them just yet. Notice how that muffin paper just comes right off. Let's cut it in half. I don't know if you can see it, but notice the swirls from when we coiled it up. They're visible on the inside of this bread. It's nice and tall. Whoa, oh, here we go. Actually, if I squeeze them from top to bottom, you can see that extra space between the coils. Pretty cool, huh? 
which means it's a lot of space to soak up any other ingredients. You know, so the presentation of this bread is beautiful. I mean, when you look at the butter and the cheese on it, it just really looks amazing. And it would be a wonderful roll for guests. It sort of looks like a rose to me. Maybe a Valentine's side bread, anyone? Add a little sugar without the cheese and maybe some chocolate shavings on top. It could make a nice dessert as well. Unfortunately, I won't be able to taste this roll for you. So our trusty Scott will be delighted to take on um, that roll. A roll for a roll, eh? Hey, Scott. <laughs> Delighted to take on that role. I know you are. <laughs> so this is a traditional Filipino ensaymada yeast roll. If you will, please take a bite. While he's chewing, this is a rich indulgent bread with traditional enriched dough ingredients like butter, egg, sugar, and milk. What makes it Filipino is the coiled shape and the addition of sugar and cheese on top. I'll give you one without anything on top, one with sugar and cheese, and one with just the cheese and butter. Interestingly enough, the coil shape has a story. The story represents the Moorish turbans worn during the conquest between the 8th and the 15th centuries. But since it's so pretty, I like to think of it as a rose. It's romantic. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, what are your thoughts? You've had a chance to taste. Yeah, very light and, and fluffy bread. Just the bread by itself is really nice texture. You can see the layers, which is kind of neat if you want to think about putting butter or something on it. We kind of get caught in those layers. The plain one had a subtle sweetness. It wasn't overwhelming sweetness, but it was kind of a, a nice subtle sweetness that would be good just with, with any type of uh, meal. Whereas the others, they were very good as well. The cheese and the and the sugar gave kind of a savory and, and salty combination, but still really subtle. So it's not like an overly sweet a dessert bread it's just mm -hmm. more of a, a subtle compliment to to the rest of the meal i would think yeah yeah you know when we made this last year i remember thinking oh my this is like my new favorite bread because it is that enriched dough so it's really rich mm -hmm. but then you can add so many layers to it and in fact you know this dough is extremely versatile and there's a link in the description of this video down below with many 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 savory and sweet variations of this roll I've even described for you how to make a roll bar. That's right, like a pizza bar or a taco bar. Invite your friends, make the dough, have it already prepared if you choose, and allow your guests to place whatever flavor combinations they want before rolling up the individual doughs and placing them in the muffin tins to go in the oven. You bake them all at the same time and everyone has a dinner side and or a dessert, depending on how many guests you have. One batch of dough, for dinner and dessert, for everyone to be happy, and they're all individualized. That's a pretty impressive recipe if you ask me. Yeah, very good. Well, thanks for watching. If you make this recipe, leave a comment, tell me how it went. It really is one of our favorite breads. I have to admit, do you agree with me? It's one of like the best breads. Yeah, I would agree. We've eaten a lot of bread and this is a good one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just smelling it and remembering it from last year, this is a must. Remember to subscribe to my channel, click the like button, and share with your family and friends. Until next time, Marco no sa mundo. Go back the world. Do you speak every language? I think you, you're, you're, so you speak every language there is. That was perfect. There's no dialect to that at all. You know what? And I have the perfect accent for every single language that I speak. It's amazing. <laughs> Every time I eat bread, you say something in a different language. I know. I this is what, like, it. eight languages now I speak? Yeah, you're uh, quad, uh, penta, uh, sex. Lingual? Uh, <laughs> octa, octolingual. Octolingual. Well, every, every week we're going to add a new language, so all you need to speak is one word in another language. You can count it, right? And how it goes? Uh, we. <laughs> Good one. All right.